That's right. Okay, um, I think that we should uh, go ahead and get started. Are you good with that, Kendall? I am ready. All right. Hi, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Hi, Kendall. everybody, for being here. I appreciate you Hi. coming back. Uh, for those of you that have done our classes before, uh, I am glad to see you back. And for those of you that are new to this, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, Ken, I just wanted to do a quick uh, introduction, a little bit of housekeeping, and then I'll turn it over to Kendall. Uh, Kendall Mattern is honorary class of 1760 from, G, uh, from GA. He, was, he has taught at GA for 31 years, and his total teaching time was 43 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Teaching all, only history, Kendall, or did you teach other things? Uh, only history, yeah. Okay. Well, that's enough. Um, and one of the things he said uh, when he left and retired in June of 2016, so five years ago, was that he stayed at GA for as long as he did, partly because he had the opportunity to develop such fun curriculum and, uh, you know, make it interesting and, and helpful to the students. And so as I approached him just before, just as the pandemic started about doing classes for everybody else in the GA community, he said, yeah, that sounds fun. Um, and ever since he's been developing several different programs to teach virtually um, all around history. The first one was the Gilded Age of, in America. Um, and then, and that was just a one day class. And then after that, he developed a series about the Gilded Age that looked at both America and uh, Britain. And then he and Dr. Niani, who you've been hearing from, uh, did a class on the his history and poetry of baseball. So it's been a great series. Um, and I'm pleased this time to welcome members from all across the GA community. Some of you are grandparents, some of you are parents of alum. We have quite a few alumni, some uh, former faculty members. Uh, so it's really a privilege to have you. Um, this is, as we've mentioned, a five course series. And I'm sure Kendall will touch on this, but I also wanna reiterate, um, I am going to record all of those. And it takes me a little while to, to download the recording and edit it a little bit. Uh, but once it's ready, I'll be sending it, sending a link to it to all of you, anybody that's registered. So even if you aren't, aren't on a class, you're gonna get the, a link to the recording. Um, the first four classes will be class-like and Kendall will be presenting. And then the fifth class is gonna be more discussion oriented. So if you want uh, some fun and, and to be able to participate in the discussion, I encourage you to try to be here for that last class. Um, also, Kendall prepares a pre-reading each week, and I'll be sending that out uh, via email, and it's also available on Patriot Connect, which is our online networking platform. So I think that's it. If you have any questions or trouble uh, getting into a class, you can always contact me um, via email, and, and my cell phone and work phone are both in my signature block. So thank you again, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks, Kendall. Thank you, Heather. Greetings, everyone. Um, <clears throat> familiar faces out there, and, and some that are, are not familiar to me and, and new to um, any of the classes that I've um, I would recommend that you um, mute yourselves now so that we don't uh, hear a, a <laughs> extraneous noise. Uh, but towards the end, I, I, I'm pretty good at timing. Um, I, I always try to get some time in for questions, uh, Q&A at the end. If not, you have my email. If you um, checked the um, reading assignment, I always have a cover letter and the email is on there. Feel free to email me if we, we don't get to the question or you don't ask it. Um, and I'll, I'll address it either directly to you or um, wait and save it for the next class. So please, the only bad questions are the ones that go on unasked. So please do ask questions. Um, since there are new people here, new to me, I, I thought I would go back in time to how I introduced all of my history classes, particularly at, at Germantown Academy, but probably at St. Joe's Prep where I was before uh, GA. So uh, greetings. And I just wanted to tell you that I'm a person who literally lives, eats, and sleeps history. Um, I've done a lot of reenacting um, and um, have worked with the uh, National Park Service at, at various battlefields, Civil War, um, although we've, I've done some French and Indian War. That's my new passion. Um, but what I've always told my students as class begins 
is that history is not fact. History is the interpretation of events. And it depends on your point of view as to how you see that history. And so really to understand history and the truth behind history, we need to understand the point of view of all those people who are reporting the history, whether it's through taking photographs, writing letters, uh, memoirs, writing books at the time of the event or after the time of the event. Um, and that's how I have always approached my study of history. And um, I've always presented points of view, both sides. Um, and I think particularly these days, because there is so, so much distortion um, and outright lying or ignoring of history uh, and events that it's imperative that I stress that. Um, it saddens me. And it's, it's absolutely a reason I'm doing this again. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that history is the struggle between liberty and order. Um, there are those who go to the extreme of liberty, and there are those who go to the extreme of order. But our best times are when we find a balance between that liberty and order. And, and so the way I look at and study and read history is through the lens of seeing the struggle between liberty and order. And those have always those ideas have always flavored um, my teaching. So with that and no more, let's get started. Pardon me while I get ready here. So, um, another term I, I have always used when talking about history, or sorry, poli American politics is that it's a blood sport. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, it, 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 we've had ugly, ugly times, and we've always had ugly times. Um, some people feel that our current situation is unique. It's not unique at all. Um, we have been a violent people um, in our politics from colonial times on, and that's uh, why I created this course. Um, a couple quotes, John Adams. There's a danger from all men. The only maxim of a free government ought to be to trust no man living with power to endanger the public liberty here. And his opposite, Jefferson, and what country can preserve its liberties if their rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. The remedy is to set them right as to facts, pardon, and pacify them. What signify a few lives lost in a century or two? The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. The thesis of this course is straightforward. Within the context of American history, the parallels between early American history and the 21st century are many. This nation has a long running tradition of both virulent political debate and political violence. As the old adage goes, there is nothing new under the sun. So um, these were traits that I've bulleted here that existed before we were a country. These existed in colonial America. Political, racial, and economic divides prevailed. Conspiracy theories abounded. Irrational fear for change in the American social and political structure. Violent actions were prevalent. Hyper-partisanship was common. Key elections remained close affairs. And these bullet points run throughout our, our history. There's, there's only a, a brief moment in, in my last class, we'll get to that time, um, that we didn't have as much of that as this. And one of the, the starters was Bacon's Rebellion, uh, which predates, obviously, the American Revolution. Um, and I'm not, I don't think I'm going to get into to Bacon right now. Um, I'll just say that he was a, uh, an American 
Um, he, he was a, an angry uh, indentured servant um, and he organized a group of indentured servants, um, slaves and free blacks uh, to openly question the leadership of the colonial upper class in Virginia. Um, scared the bejesus out of the uh, Virginia leaders. And uh, as a result, they created a series of slave codes beginning in 1705, which cracked down on the ability of whites and blacks to intermingle. Um, at the same time, just a few years later, a similar uprising of this took place in Maryland, uh, led by John Coode and the Protestant Associators. Um, with the same results. In the end, uh, um, power always wins out. So the history that frames tonight's lesson begins with the French and Indian War and um, will close with the emergence of political parties. Um, so we'll look at a little briefly the American Revolution, the Articles of Confederation and the Constitutional Convention. This class, number one, really sets the tone for and the found, lays the foundation for the main ideas which we'll take through the other um, three classes before we get to our discussion in, in class number five. I really didn't have to put in the French and Indian War, but since it's my new passion, I had to. Um, and there, there's a, a point or two to make here. Um, French and Indian War, I assume you all know about. Um, it was a struggle between France and England and helped to set some of the parameters for which the American Revolution will be fought. Um, even back then, in the midst of these time, this, this war, uh, there was no unity among the colonies. Every colony was out for themselves. Uh, big ones picked on the little ones and Big ones fought amongst themselves. The big fights were between Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, and uh, Virginia. And so Franklin pens you know, this what is argued to be the first American political cartoon. For those who don't know me, you'll get used to it. I use a lot of political cartoons. It, it's one of my passions, um, and I like to use them to illustrate. So the join or die. Um, which has been co-opted by some other people lately, um, goes back to colonial times and uh, speaks to the, the lack of organization among, and unity among, among the states. He'll, he'll revive it for the American Revolution. Um, so we fight the war, we win. Um, and I'll point out the map. Um, and on the map, you can see where the original 13 colonies are established. And just to the left or west of the um, new North American British Empire, you see it's written the Proclamation of 1763. That was a line that the British Empire, the British government drew arbitrarily. Uh, it's, it's within the Appalachian mountain chain, essentially. And it was meant to keep settlers out of that land, which is identified as Indian land, although it wasn't going to be Indian land always, uh, according to the British. But it was mainly so that the settlers wouldn't go in and start more fights between the, uh, the Indian tribes and, and the white settlers. But um, that will never work. And uh, it will be one of the factors for which the American Revolution will be fought. The other is bullet point two. Great Britain pledged to protect Catholicism in former French lands of North America. Well, the vast majority, unless you live in the Baltimore area, uh, were not Catholic. They were virulent Protestants of various forms. Um, I guess I wouldn't call the Quakers virulent, but all the rest of, of the colonials were <laughs> Protestant for the most part and uh, despised Catholics. And they'll... <laughs> Catholics will be picked upon by the Protestant colonials for a very long time, and, and that will continue on into our history as a nation, um, because we'll, we'll talk about Irish Americans. The, 
the people who were peopling, um, settling North America during the, the colonial time um, were a hodgepodge of Native Americans, religious dissidents like the Puritans who came over and settled in the Boston, Massachusetts region, um, struggling European middle class, meaning those who couldn't afford to buy land in, um, in Europe. And when we say Europe, we're really, for the most part, the vast, the big numbers are um, English and German. Um, and so looking for a new opportunity, you, you'll get those. Um, the Scotch-Irish, um, who have all kinds of problems and have fought all kinds of wars, which we're not going to get into right now. Uh, they despise the English. They're coming over. My patriarchal ancestors are Scotch-Irish. Um, indentured servants, people who um, signed a contract, usually five to seven years long. Um, you had your uh, ticket paid for to come over here, and then you worked for the purchaser of that, or the person who uh, paid for you to come over. And uh, it most of the time was very difficult work. Um, and uh, indentured servants were not, not happy with them the people who were controlling them. And then of course, the West African slave. Um, what these people all have in common is essentially one thing. They don't like the British um, or they're not happy with their situation. So we start with a large group of people who um, are not very happy with the, the thought of living under British empire. And, and that is, is gonna be trouble for the British. Um, it's a stew that's going to boil over. Um, maybe someday I'll teach American Revolution class, uh, but, and I don't, I'm not going to go over these things. These, the English Constitution, the Navigation Acts, the Colonial Charters, the Royal Charter, that's what was the underpinning to uh, colonial in North America under the British. But the last bullet point is the key. Uh, yes, we had all of these different laws and agreements that tied us to the British Empire. However, as long, because we were so successful in um, our trade and the, the kinds of goods that we could send over to Europe, um, the British government pretty much left North America alone. And so it became known as Saudi from the six, 1763. Pretty much could do what we wanted to do. So there was all kinds of smuggling. The British knew we were smuggling but didn't care as long as um, they got their share and all kinds of other illicit trade that was going on. Um, and so the North American colonials got used to being left alone. Then the key date is 1763. That's the end of the French and Indian War. And all of a sudden, Britain has this huge debt and now they're scared out of their wits, which they should have been because it was an unprecedented amount of money. And so now they're going to take a little closer look at the relationship, the financial relationship between the colonies. And of course, that's when all the trouble begins. Um, so, of course, um, without getting into all that, trouble does <laughs> begin. And of course, we declare independence in 1776. Um, some important concepts. You know, these are truths that are self-evident, that are identified in, in the Declaration. And all men are created equal. Now, of course, what that meant then versus now is very different. Um, there are unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that supposedly we all had the right to have. And governments are instituted by men and obtain their power from the consent of the governed. And the key concepts that are born out of the Enlightenment, which was an important intellectual movement, started in um, Europe, uh, actually in France, but then spread out through Europe and, and would come over here too. Um, and our two greatest proponents of the Enlightenment would be Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. But these were important ideas, period. And these would certainly be uh, foundational for us to figure out where we're gonna go from here if we want our independence. 
Now, who supported the revolution? Remember, we got all these grumbly people who don't like the British. But that doesn't mean they like all of American colonies either. Um, th th there were no pollsters um, back then. Um, and so we do some guessing here. And the current group of historians guess that about 20% of the North American colonial public was loyalist and about the same size were the patriots. And if you do your math, that means about 60%, which is the majority, um, didn't take sides and they had to be won over. And many will remain skeptical and avoid the revolution pro or con from the beginning uh, and throughout. In, in to quote a historian, in the end, many loyalists simply left America. About 80,000 of them fled to Canada or Britain during or just after the war because loyalists were often wealthy, educated, older, and Anglican religious. The American social fabric was altered by their departure. American history bends them as traitors, but most were just trying to maintain the lifestyles to which they had become accustomed. I think that's an important idea to keep in mind here. Um, first of all, their background and their age, that's their point of view. Um, and that, you know, they had been used to a certain way of life and all of a sudden that disappeared. And what are they going to do? Um, and by them leaving, that will dramatically alter the population that is now in North America and calling themselves Americans. Um, so the Continental Congress did a couple good things. One was to declare um, independence, and the second was to create a government in the midst of a revolution. And it was a good start. Um, I said they did a couple good things. Um, they weren't perfect. They did a lousy job of uh, funding everything and in dealing with the Continental Army. Um, George Washington was left to hang out to dry uh, most of the time, and that's a struggle uh, for another day. Uh, it makes for an interesting piece in, in studying American Revolution. Um, George was a hero for, for more reasons than what you might think. Um, so they create this government, and it's the first government, and um, there's no executive branch. The Congress has no enforcement powers. It can say, well, here's a law, but that doesn't mean anybody's going to pay any attention to it. Funding for the government was voluntary. That, there's a laugh. You could pay taxes if you wanted to. I hmm. wonder how that worked. Each individual state had complete control over its own trade. Um, so they could, you know, somebody making shoes in Massachusetts could deal with people who wanted to buy them in New Hampshire in any way, shape, or form that they wanted to. No regulation of, of um, between states, um, which of course today we do have. There was no judicial branch, only local um, courts, and amending the articles <clears throat> required unanimous consent by the states. And um, I think there was only one time when the Confederation ever really came up with any meaningful unanimous decision. Um, with the revolution over and um, Americans trying to figure out, you know, where do we go from here? And, and under this weak government that, that we had, the, the Articles Confederation, um, trouble is brewing. And one of the biggest, most notable events was Shays' Rebellion, which took place in 1786-87. Um, A revolutionary uh, veteran organized other revolutionary veterans and disgruntled farmers um, in Massachusetts who were upset with um, the value of their land, which was plummeting, and at the same time owing taxes on their land, um, which they couldn't pay, and the Massachusetts state government then acquiring those lands because of default. Um, so Shays gathers approximately 4,000 men and they'll march on Springfield and uh, attempt to gain control of the armory 
with the purpose of then taking over the government itself and running Massachusetts the way they wanted it to. Um, this will scare the, the, con the Confederation government um, to no end and will be a, a key factor in, in, in why we would get the Constitution uh, to replace the Articles of Confederation. Other troubles were brewing. We had a, a pending financial crisis. There was no stable currency. It was, I mean, there, there was a continental currency and the paper was, um, was not worth much at all. Uh, we had racked up a huge debt. Um, if it hadn't been for the French, um, who of course have been in the news lately, um, we probably would have had a difficult winning, difficult time winning the American Revolution. I think Americans sometimes forget what role the French played. Not that I'm showing any sympathy for the current um, <laughs> argument over submarines, but um, nonetheless, there, there was an important early connection there. Not that the French were supporting our, our fight for independence um, at all. They just didn't like the British. Um, the Confederation Congress, as I kind of intimated, really couldn't do much, um, and it lacked any kind of central leadership. Uh, there was the unrest. We, I talked about the uh, Shays Rebellion. There was also the Newburgh Conspiracy, which was a group of uh, Continental officers who were upset because they hadn't been paid and um, didn't like what was going on. And so actually, <laughs> there were, we think, we have a couple letters that a couple members of the uh, Congress sent them letters to these officers. They were positioned in upper state New York after the war, um, not just the officers, but the army. And um, they were encouraged to, to maybe do something about the situation. Um, and word gets out about this conspiracy, which was real. And uh, Congress actually leaves Philly for a while um, out of concern that it actually would take place. It did not take place, but it, it was perceived to be real and it, it, it was a real threat. And the government had no way to deal with westward expansion and its inherent challenges. I mean, the, the, the colonials were, were salivating to get this cheap land, uh, which was vast now that the British could no longer control their situation. And, and you have the Indian populations and, and all of what's about to happen. And um, something had to be done, but no one could do anything about it. So those are kind of the big problems that people are dealing with, plus the threat of overthrow of government. Um, most political cartoons in the early days were pretty crude, this being one an example of it. Um, if you can't, I mean, you, you can't read the bubbles, but my point being here that if you didn't read the bubbles, you wouldn't really ever understand what the cartoons are all about. Um, so they're, they're not, up to the, our current standards, but nonetheless, they're historical, and so I like to use them. And of course, uh, the, the phrase here, a house divided against itself cannot stand, is the, the name of the cartoon and, and, and speaks to the dilemma um, that the country is facing here as uh, we are crumbling um, and dividing up into various groups, factions. Um, and here, this cartoon addresses two of the groups, Call, they call them the nationalists on the left and the localists on the right. The nationalists are those who uh, support a strong central government. Thus, the quote here, comply with Congress and quote, I abhor the anti-federal faction. Um, these are people who believe we need a, a powerful central government um, and therefore would tend to be more on kind of the pro-British side, even though the revolution was fought against the British. Um, and the localists here would be the anti-federalists, uh, the quote-unquote Republicans. Um, you know, and some of the people here are saying success to Shays and the people are oppressed. And, and um, so already here, before we even get to the United States under the Constitution, you already have this important argument that's central to the history of the United States right up to 2021 
and that is the group of people who believe that we need a strong, powerful central government um, to offer leadership, um, and and those who totally disagree and feel that you know power should be left up either to the individual or to local government, um, and feel that a strong central government will just oppress um, the people. So there's an important idea that has been hanging around um, in colonial America and, and Britain and France for a while. Um, it, it, I mentioned before the, the Enlightenment and um, the idea, uh, central idea of the Enlightenment was this concept of virtue, virtue or uh, the Latin virtu or virtu. Um, the idea was that leadership should be in the hands of those who are self-made successful men. And I underline the word men here. Um, meaning these are people who don't need to work. They have been successful. They have large estates or plantations. Um, they have self-generating um, finances. Um, so therefore they're successful. They don't need to work. Key, key term here, work. Therefore, the assumption being, and it is only an assumption, that these men, self-made men, will be virtuous, that they will be relied upon to lead people because they don't need money. They won't fall victim to desiring more, more land, more money, more power, because they already have it. And in one sense, they do already have it. They, are, they have land. They have power, they have money. Um, assumption being that they didn't want more, <laughs> obviously open to question. But nonetheless, this was a, an important underlying concept for the framers, the founders and the frame, uh, framers being the con for the constitution, that you need successful men uh, who won't fall prey to desires. John Adams. Virtue must underlay all institutional arrangements if they are to be healthy and strong. The principles of democracy are as easily destroyed as human nature is corrupted. John Jay, one of the Federalist Paper writers. Let virtue, honor, the love of liberty be the soul of this constitution. This principle will be the only enemies able to destroy it. Um, they really believe in, in this concept of, of virtue and that if they had virtuous leadership, all would, be, all would be well. And that's why from the very beginning, there's no concept, no thinking that there'll be political parties. They hated political parties. They looked to England and, and saw the political parties that were fighting amongst each other in the empire and they wanted no parts of that. And they blamed the political, the English political parties in part for the American revolution. Um, they also blamed the king too, but they saw parties as evil and, it un and more unnecessary because America was filled with virtuous leaders. Here's a couple more quotes. Sam Adams, radical, Bostonian uh, who, who led the Sons of Liberty. Neither the wisest constitution nor the wisest laws will secure the liberty and happiness of a people whose manners are universally corrupt. He therefore is the truest friend of the liberty of his country who tries most to promote its virtue. Um, Thomas Jefferson, no government can continue good but under the control of the people and their minds are to be informed by education, what is right and what wrong, to be encouraged in habits of virtue and to be deterred from those of vice. These are the inculcations necessary to render the people a sure basis for the structure and order of government. And it goes on and on and on. I could fill up pages of all the testimony about um, virtue, but that, that was a key concept and both sides even though they're already <laughs> choosing sides, believed in that idea. Um, so as people gathered 
to go to um, Philadelphia to write a new constitution. The deal was to revise the Confederation, but once they got there, uh, <laughs> the Federalists, those who want the strong sense of government, will undermine the argument for revising and say they're, they're too bad, we can't fix them, we need to start over. So the playing fields pulled out from underneath the opponents from the, from the day one. And the opponents are the anti-federalists. And the anti-federalists don't get enough credit. Um, you know, the, the winners always dictate the history. Um, and of course the anti-federalists are the losers here. But they were extremely important and uh, need to be appreciated because they really set the tone for the debate and they really force those who want the strong central government, those who will become known as the Federalists, um, to sharpen their arguments and to um, compromise. You know, a key word here, compromise, um, something that we, we struggle today. Um, so two of the key anti-Federalists, uh, names that don't you know, get the, the coverage that, that they deserve are George Mason and James Winthrop. Um, James, George Mason, the president will therefore be unsupported by proper information and advice will, and will generally be directed by minions and favorites. The anti federalists were concerned about creating a president and felt that um, he would have too much power and that he wouldn't have to listen to the advice of informed, virtuous people, but it said minions and favorites. He also wrote, he had the unrestrained power for granting pardons for treason, which may be sometimes exercised to screen from punishment those whom he had secretly instigated to commit the crime and thereby prevent a discovery of his own guilt. So a lot of concern over power of the executive. Uh, Winthrop, nothing strongly impels a man to regard the interests of his constituents as the certainty of bringing to the general mass of the people from whence he was taken, where he must participate in their burdens. There is a passion natural to the mind of man, especially a free man, which renders him impatient of restraint. So the Anti-Federalists were not imbued with this idea of virtue. Um, they did not believe that all leaders were naturally virtuous and, and mistrusted um, individuals if left to their own resorts. And that is, is a, a key point to that they will drive home in all their debates at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. Uh, here's two more quotes. Um, favorite pastime in the press was to write anonymously. So Agrippa, which is a famous, um, I think Roman, yes, Roman figure. Um, it's, it, it's, 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 it's not Agrippa, it's, it's actually uh, James Winthrop. Let us not flatter ourselves that we shall always have good men to govern us. If we endeavor to be like other nations, we shall have more bad men than good ones to exercise extensive powers. That circumstance alone will corrupt them. While they fancy themselves the vice regents of God, they will resemble him only in power, but will always depart from his wisdom and goodness real distrust for people. And an old wig in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was lively, probably the central place for all these debates, um, not just because the convention was there, but the major newspapers were all pretty much coming out of Philly at this time. Um, so old wig writes, a few words on this head will close the present letter. In the first place, the office of president of the United States appears to me to be clothed with such powers as are dangerous. To be the fountain of all honors in the United States, commander in chief of the army, navy and militia, with the power of making treaties and of granting pardons, and to be vested with an authority to put a negative upon all laws, unless two thirds of both houses shall persist in enacting it, 
and put their names down upon calling the yeas and nays for that purpose is in reality to be a king as much a king as the king of Great Britain and a king too of the worst kind, an elective king. So you get the idea of uh, the concerns that the anti-federalists have. So the federals who are more famous, of course, they will collect their essays or published first in newspapers and become known as the Federalist Papers. Um, foundational documents important for all um, constitutional lawyers, politicians um, to read these. I wish more of our Washington politicians would read these. I suspect some do not. Um, they're informative. Um, and have a lot of wisdom to impart, whether you agree with them or not. Um, Madison, who was originally on the other side of the aisle, joins the Federalists because he's won over believing that we needed a strong central government. Um, and his point, he's, he's concerned with factions, calls it the mission, mischief of faction. Faction is, is going to become a political party. Political interest groups are inevitable. Quote, liberty is to faction what air is to fire, an ailment without which it instantly expires. Um, and also this idea of the virtuous and non-divine office holders. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. Um, and these are the kinds of arguments that were made by the Federalists as they refute point by point arguing A, that we needed a strong central government, B, that you needed a president of the United States, um, and C, that you need a judiciary to uh, resolve disputes, and that the central government should have more power than the state government. And that, again, becomes the central argument, not only about having a president, but who should have more power, the states, and the states had more power in the Convent the Articles of, of Confederation um, or the central government and in the con new constitution, of course, the central government um, presides over the states. One of the ideas that the Federalists had in, in you know, if, if the anti-Federalists were driven by this fear of a president and uh, the non-virtuous human beings, um, one of the driving forces of the Federalists was this idea that, you know, they took the word democracy and, and, and inverted it to call it a mobocracy. They were, they were concerned with the masses. You know, they had, they had seen Shays' Rebellion. They had seen the other rebellions, you know, about to list a whole bunch. Um, and they were, they were afraid that the people had, may have too much power, to be honest. And of course, this is going to play into the Electoral College, a topic which I'm saving for next session. But needless to say, mobocracy is in the minds of all these people. And Hamilton, um, he, he spoke before the New York Ratification Convention, but before he did that, um, he spoke at an outdoor assembly um, nearby, and um, the, the anti-federalists showed up and blasted him with tomatoes and rocks and all kinds of um, foul things yelled at him, um, one of my favorites that I put below his, this is a statue of him, a Scotchman of whom nothing good is known. Um, he is of Scotch ancestry. Anyway, um, having a taste of the mob before he went in, in his address, which he had pre-written, um, the body of people do not possess the discernment and stability necessary for systematic government. To, de to deny that they are frequently led in the gro into the grossest errors by misinformation and passion would be a flattery which their own good sense must despise. Um, so if the anti-federalists were concerned with the um, non-virtuous leaders, um, certainly the federalists was, <laughs> were concerned with the, what I fondly call smelly masses. Um, and, and what they might do to influence government unduly. So they had the ratification debate, and of course it's gonna pass. Uh, this is a cartoon that appeared, and you can see um, this is a pro-federalist 
cartoon and the hand of God is uh, pushing the pillars of the new foundation into place. Um, so uh, it, divine providence was behind the Federalists, I guess. God was on their side. So we got a new constitution. I'm not gonna go over the constitution. Um, uh, again, I, I, I wish that more of our elected officials would read the constitution um, because they might find it informative. But uh, nonetheless, we, we get seven articles, um, each one with uh, a specific point behind it. Um, and of course, the big three were one, two, and three, legislature, executive, and, and judiciary. Um, but we'll let that go here. Needless to say, we got a new constitution, but all kinds of problems already existed, which I had identified. And um, more problems are, are brewing quickly as George Washington takes over. Um, during his time period of eight years, we see that factions are becoming political parties. So not believing that we needed political parties, um, people decided they did need political parties and they are formed hard and fast over these four topics, the ratification itself, the French Revolution and the Judiciary Act, the establishment of the first bank of the United States and Jay's treaty. Now these, I'm, I'm not gonna get into these um, here. Just know that these were, wait, well, you can understand the ratification is gonna be a biggie, but um, they, they were all important topics and for which those who wanted a strong central government and those who want a states centered government, um, are not gonna agree on any of these things. The only one I'll point out is the French Revolution, which might seem a little weird. You know, the French support us in, in the revolution, give us a lot of money. Um, they played a role militarily towards the end of the war. Um, I don't, I think it's safe to say, I don't, I don't think we could have won the war without them, um, particularly for their money. Um, but the Federalists, the strong centralizers, even though we fought the war against the English, they're going to support the English when the French Revolution breaks out. And, and the so-called Republicans, as they're going to start calling themselves, the Anti-Federalists, Thomas Jefferson's gang, they're going to support the French and say that the French Revolution is a good thing. It's a natural extension of what we've just done, um, which isn't really accurate, but they'll say that. And um, so it, the French Revolution is the first one of the first major foreign policy pieces that will help to define our, the formation of our political parties. Um, and it's, it's a hot topic. So anyway, George Washington you know, suffers. He stays above the fray. He doesn't take sides, but, but everybody pretty much knows he's, he's a Federalist in heart, uh, believes in a strong central government and, and all that. Um, but he doesn't take sides. And in the end, he, he gives his farewell address. Excuse me, in 1796. And he shares his opinion for the first time publicly. However, political parties may now and then answer popular ends. They are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. So you get the clear picture that uh, Washington is, is not happy with uh, the formation of political parties. And, and he understands that it slows things down. Once you get political parties going, um, taking action in Washington that is gonna bog down in the fight. Jefferson, um, two years later, two political sects have arisen within the United States. The one believing that the executive is the branch of our government, which the most needs support. The other that like the analogous branch in the English government 
it is already too strong for the Republican parts of the Constitution. And therefore, in equivocal cases, they incline to the legislative powers. And of course, he's laying out a case for um, less central power, less central authority. So a major um, fuel, and in fact, if you, if you read um, the quote unquote homework that I sent out, um, then the excerpt from the journal talks about the, the partisan press and how nasty it was, and it was nasty. Every bit as nasty as anything you, you might hear today on either side, whichever side you stand or if you try to stay in the middle. Um, <clears throat> The ugly partisan press <laughs> for the fact of life from the beginning. Um, now, the one thing that people knew back then, clearly, all papers were privately owned by the parties. So you subscribe to, to your party of choice, just like some people today only watch one news source um, and, and know that they're getting comforting news, even if it's not true um, or accurate, I might say. Um, that was the same thing back then too. So it's, it, this is not a new phenomenon in any way, shape or form. Um, so partisan press gets really nasty. Uh, of George Washington, a favorite um, target by the Republicans, Quote, a brief but trite review of your six years administration marked the progressive steps which have led the way to the present public evils that afflict your country. The unerring voice of posterity will not fail to render the just sentence of condemnation on the man who has entailed upon us, upon his country, deep and incurable public evils. This is George you're talking about. Of Jefferson, the other side. Pull down the present aristocracy and build the babble of mobocracy. And ere 97, I ween, will introduce the guillotine. Shout, Sarah, confusion wed. Take off each federal stickler's head. Sure then our government will fall. The Jacobins all in all, will be all in all. Uh, reference to the French Revolution. Uh, William Cobbett, uh, referenced in, in the cartoon on the right, he was an Englishman <laughs> who was an agent of the king, actually. And he, he was over here at, at this time frame, and he was fomenting all kinds of trouble to support the British side of, of the argument, therefore pro-federalist. Um, and, and I wanted to read this one thing. The Republican press turned its sights squarely on the once untouchable president, using every term of abuse it could muster and leveling every charge it could concoct, no matter how implausible. Washington was senile, he was a blasphemer, he was a womanizer, he had embezzled public funds, he was a tool of the British crown or desired a crown of his own. Hamilton not only controlled him behind the scenes, but was somehow also his illegitimate son, Washington had been a secret British agent during the Revolutionary War, and his efforts to betray the patriotic cause were foiled by Benedict Arnold beating him to the punch. Um, so you get the idea. Partisan press, pretty tough. Nothing new. And of course, lots of public um, fights and um, a lot more violence is, is breaking out. As, remember, I'm, I'm kind of going through this point by point, but this is all happening at one time. So there's a mass of confusion, a mass of chaos um, while they try to form the new government and to move forward and improve the situation they have found themselves in. Fight breaks out on the floor of, of the House of Representatives between uh, Matthew Lyon of Vermont a Jeffersonian Republican, and Roger Griswold, a Connecticut Federalist. Um, it's a silly argument, but they, they, they go at it nonetheless. There is violence on the floor. Um, this is mild compared to what's about to happen, as we'll see in future lessons. Um, but the significance here is that Lyon's actions in that case, he becomes the first congressman to have charge, charges filed against him with that body's ethics committee, 
although he escaped censure through a vote in the House. Um, so this was the first official time that the Ethics Committee is going to try to toss somebody, but will fail. Ethics Committee usually does fail right up to today. Um, so violent protests, again, are happening all, all over the place during this, this same time frame. Um, I, I threw in the regulators here, uh, even though it's uh, pre-American Revolution, because of an example of the vigilantism that takes place in the South and was popular um, and remains popular to this day. Uh, you had the, the Pennsylvania mutiny, you had the Shades Rebellion I mentioned, there was a paper money riot in New Hampshire, there was a doctor's mob riot in New York City, uh, the Whiskey Rebellion in Pennsylvania, uh, this is a cartoon referencing that. I have relatives who actually were whiskey rebels. Um, again, the Scotch-Irish caused all kinds of trouble in Western Europe, or Western PA, excuse me. Um, they wanted that cheap land, take it away from the Indians. And Fry's Rebellion, and this one's curious maybe for those who live in Pennsylvania, which I think is most of you, uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch actually engage in an uprising of sorts, and they're upset at the tax that is uh, being put on them for their land because they believe that that money is going to be used towards the army, which of course they weren't opposed to any kind of violence, Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, but anyway, this is a, a cartoon of uh, the Whiskey Rebellion. And I see I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna speed things up here to the end. Oh, here we go, last slide. So um, I've, I've made my case that there's nothing new under the sun, that um, we had a, a virulent political debate that often resorted in lying, uh, cheating, subterfuge, and violence. And that that is part of our heritage that has remained throughout much, not all, but much of our political history right up to today. Um, Next time, we'll look at John Adams and his presidency. Uh, we will look at the election of Jefferson, and lots of people were convinced when Jefferson was elected that the United States would completely fall apart. Uh, we'll look at the Electoral College and its role, and then we'll look at the rise of Andrew Jackson and what becomes known as Jacksonian populism. So, without further ado, I will um, stop sharing and let me get the broad view. And um, let me just comment on, on the homework. <laughs> I thought I'd call it, you know, I, I gave the letter written by Adams to Jefferson, um, which probably is more appropriate for next time. But you can see how much whining he does about what was me and all the bad things that happened during my presidency. And of course, he calls them acts of terror. Um, but he really makes a case for himself. The, um, and, and then the journal article, as I already referenced, talks about the uh, partisan press. So, um, questions? I, I had former students, I could start asking, I mean, you, know, um, you should know, those of you who never had me as a teacher, um, I, I never, le I mean, lecturing is, <laughs> is new to me in a sense. I never, I've rarely lectured unless we had like four snow days in a row and had to catch up. But um, so my classes were mostly run by asking questions to the students, uh, often fondly known as the cold call. And um, some lived in terror of, of the cold call um, because we sat around a nice oval table. Most everybody always got a question and um, those who weren't prepared, although I, I see Beth there, she was always prepared, uh, one of my perfect students. <laughs> um, and um, so I'd ask questions. I'm, I'm not gonna do that. Um, and if we're done and there aren't any questions, that's great. I guess I did a, a good job. Um, or maybe somebody wants to question something I've said, uh, please I, feel I have free. One question. I have one question about. Sure, Greg. Do you know what the composition was of Germantown Academy, the, the 
when it was founded in 1760 and, and when the revolution came uh, between loyalists and patriots? Good. It's a good question. And although I'm going to look into it a bit more, from what I know now, I'll say this, uh, because I never thought about that. It's a great question. Um, we were a German school. Um, it was created in German town. Um, it, I always, and I know this well, because I used to do a uh, history of the GAPC football game, and, and therefore the, the uh, competition between Germantown Academy and Penn Charter. Um, and the the Germans despised the Quakers. Hate might not be too strong a word here. And so they did not want their children to be in any way infected by Quakerism. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they wanted the German language preserved. So back in those days, German was a required uh, subject matter for, for lessons. Um, with that in mind, and given their German background, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, they, they were not politically affiliated as far as I know, um, but they were patriots and um, they support the American Revolution. Of course, our, our school um, in its original site served as, as a hospital during the Battle of Germantown. Um, and the revolution was always uh, celebrated. But as far as I know, given their background, they were anti... So, they were cut, okay, it's coming, the brain's starting to function. Um, they were caught up with not liking the Quaker government in Philadelphia. And um, the, of course the Quaker government was trouble for everybody because they're, they're really not friends of either the Federalists or the Anti-Federalists or, or Republicans, Jeffersonians. Um, but my assumption is, and again, I, I will check in on this if I can, find anything, that they were pretty much pro-federalists. Um, but I'll check on that. That's the best I can do off the top of my head, Greg. Another question? And I'm over here there, Kendall. Um, and I miss those round tables, by the way. Uh, <laughs> the, my question is, since so much of our, I'll call it early American history, was borrowed from you know, other concepts, ideas, Magna Carta, for example, where did this idea of virtuous leaders not wanting power emanate from? Do you have any idea? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, uh, that is a central principle within Enlightened thinking that, again, starts in Paris and then spreads out. Um, it's in the English Constitution, actually, as well. That doesn't mean they followed it, but um, they, the English believed this as well. They didn't necessarily practice it, but they talked to it and believed that, and it, it's in England, of course, the aristocracy, it's one way they can uphold the concept of English aristocracy by saying, well, of course, we're the natural born leaders. We don't need to work. Um, and so we know what's best for everyone. So absolutely a central point. And, and Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Adams, Ben Franklin, they all believed that. Um, and some actually acted like that. Unfortunately, not everyone did. And of course, virtue has died on the vine as far as I'm concerned. There's a long Thank history you. of humanity's desire for a benevolent, desireless executive or ruler <laughs> from Plato's philosopher kings to basically Arnold Schwarzenegger's a uh, campaign when he ran for governor. It was, I'm already famous. I'm too rich to be corrupted by the state lobbyists and I can't run for president. So I'm not going to ditch you guys. <laughs> Very good, Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Don't worry. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Matthew would know. He, he, he has studied all this too. So if, if you didn't believe me, you can, you can, you can believe Matthew. So, I, had a, I had a question for you in terms of framing for the uh, these sessions. Um, at the beginning, you started out by saying that, you know, we're, we're, we're not really living in unique times. And my initial reaction was like, well, of course we are. But, you know, it's one of these, you know, all, all theories are true. It's just, uh, a question. Of it's just a question of boundary conditions. So I guess I'm asking, so what are the boundary conditions? Like along which dimensions are you proposing to demonstrate that we are not living in unique times? <laughs> well, all times are unique. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and when your perspective is of the last 
10 years or so, um, or take it back to Clinton, maybe from Clinton on, you know, that, that can look like a unique time. But my argument is, um, and it's not really my argument, I'm copying it from other historians who are making the case too, that um, in general terms, you know, political violence, uh, attacks on capitals, um, uprisings, whatever, you know, whatever terms you want to call, they have been a part of our history almost from the very beginning to the end. I mean, there are a few years and only really a few years where you don't have it. And of course, the Civil War is the big one. And that's where I said, you know, in my cover that you know, there are people saying that, you know, these are the, in fact, John Meacham said it today, you know, these are the worst times since he's been saying that for a long time. And I respect John Meacham, he's brilliant. Um, these are the worst times since uh, the Civil War. Um, again, depends on your perspective. And um, if, if you ask people from the 1840s uh, with the Know Nothing riots and all that and stuff we're gonna get into, uh, you know, th th those were the worst times. So it's all relative, so. But sure, you can, I'm, I'm generalizing. <laughs> and you, you can always pick apart generalizations. Anyway, that's, I'll stick with my position. Seems credible. <laughs> I was wondering where you were drawing the fence around. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sure. We got a couple more minutes. Any more questions? Hello, Emily. Hey, um, thanks for the class. Great as always. So I have um, another question kind of along those lines, given kind of the nascent United States right after um, the revolution and even during the period leading up to it, kind of the lack of really just like central, strong central government. And, you know, are you surprised that things weren't worse and more factionalized and there weren't more um, rebellions and other kind of incidents of like mob violence? I was pretty shocked to hear that the Pennsylvania Dutch engaged in, um, you know, acts of rebellion to protest paying taxes to fund, you know, a military, but it kind of seems like things weren't as bad as they could have been. But I'd love your take on that. Um, could they have been worse? I, I guess, but I mean, they were pretty bad during the American Revolution itself. Uh -huh. um, you know, and a lot of people who didn't want, who wanted to stay on the sidelines, and as I said, a majority of the people in this country at that time wanted to stay on the sidelines and not take sides, were drawn into it. Um, on one of those slides I threw in the regulators, uh, the re you know, if, if you're a fan of that uh, fantasy show on Showtime or whatever it is, um, the time travelers, I forget, I think he's in the regulators now anyway. Um, but the, the regulators is as nasty a time frame in North Carolina, uh, North Carolina region, the Carolinas, as we've ever had in, in vigilantism and attacking innocent people um, and, and dragging in. So I think locally, um, there, there were a lot of bad times, um, but after the war, people just wanted to get on. And, and so I, I think there was a grace period um, f to some degree, but within a couple of years, things start percolating again. Um, you know, and Shays was, was a scary moment. And so is the Newburgh conspiracy. If you start thinking that your military figures, leaders, officers are, are gonna start organizing a coup, um, that had substance to it. Um, it. It doesn't take place, but it, it was in the, in the works. Um, and George had something to do with putting that, that, putting, putting that to bed. Um, so surprised that there wasn't more, I don't know if I'd been, I'm surprised there wasn't more, but it, it, times were tense. They were tough, and, but people were desperate. They were, it was a hard scrabble time, you know. Uh, be, there was a depression of sorts taking place. The, the money was worthless. They were looking for leadership, both at the local and, and, and a national level. Um, they didn't know which way to turn. But of course, all hell breaks loose, you know, once we get the constitution going and every, the daggers come out and the sides are taken and, of course, we've had political parties ever since. Oh, thank you. Also, I was pretty taken with the Hamilton quote. Um, I just want to look at it again. I screenshot it. Um, that uh, was basically 
the masses, you know, can't be trusted and they need a really strong central government in order to ensure stability. And it's funny because if you think about, you know, international relations and kind of especially this administration's view for like pushing democracy and fighting back against autocracy everywhere, it's kind of funny what our founders would say about the need for basically a strongman rule in order to keep the masses in check. Um, so kind of the foundations of our democracy don't seem to be all that different <laughs> than what other leaders around the world might be saying. We just, you know, aren't yeah. seeing the enemies the same as they do. So that's my comment. I agree. Sides were being chosen and neither side trusted the other. Yep. Um, I see we've, we've reached, well, 6.15 my time, 8.15 your time. Um, so I, I guess this is where we say an end. I see there were four things in the chat. I'm sorry I didn't look at those uh, before I close. I'll check in case there are questions um, and I'll try to answer. And again, you have my email. Please feel free to yell at me if you don't like what I said or um, have other questions. Uh, that's fine. I'm a big boy. Um, I can take it, but I'll yell back probably, um, at least through email. So um, thank you very much for joining me. And I hope I see you next time. If not, catch the recording. We'll do three more phases of history. And then I see um, Jeff Pollack is, is in, in the, uh, or was anyway, um, in the audience. And of course, he will join me um, on, on the last one when we do a, a big broad q and I'll set some parameters, um, but you know, there won't be anything you can't ask. And uh, Jeff is an expert um, and I think you'll enjoy uh, his perspective and uh, his angle from his work uh, that he does these days. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening. I, I hope I didn't bore you. So thanks, Kendall. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.